Hey, book lovers, want to hear a story? Welcome back to Storytime with M. This is a bonus episode from M's Books and Cats podcast, where I am sharing my book Super Gym with you, a chapter or sometimes two a week. And this week is chapter 26. We are getting very close to the end. Next week will actually be the final chapters, and then Storytime with M will take a brief break, and I will be back in the fall with another book. So stay tuned for that. Now, as always, Super Gym does contain mature content, which might be triggering for some listeners, so please listen with caution. Otherwise, please enjoy Chapter 26 of Super Gym. Her bunkmates avoided her after that night. Everyone did. It didn't matter to Maggie. Every day was the same. They shuffled to the warehouse, climbed onto their treadmills, and ran. In the evenings, they returned to their bunks weak and weary, too tired to talk. Maggie saw their fearful glances, but she didn't care. She was too tired to care. Since the death of her grotesque counselor, she'd been left alone. Her treadmill speed was set high, and it never varied. She ran without a break for hours. No one checked on her progress. Her muscles cramped, her shoes filled with blood. She kept running. There was nothing else to be done. She didn't try to escape. She was too tired to think, too tired to plot. Her powers were gone. She didn't feel them humming under her fingertips. When she raised her hand, nothing happened. Tanya looked at her with mute horror as she feebly lifted her hand. No one else was watching. Maggie tried to smile at her. Guess my powers are gone, she croaked. Her throat was parched. She hadn't spoken to anyone in days. Tanya put her hands over her face and turned away. Maggie was getting thin. She had not been fed since the incident, not even a pill or a vitamin. She was starving to death, slowly, painfully. No one cared, and Maggie didn't expect them to. She expected to die. Line up. Body weight day. The counselors screamed into bullhorns and dragged the slower clients from their beds. They pushed everyone into two long lines. The campers were separated into pairs. Maggie was partnered with a girl she recognized from the treadmills. She was young and frail with large eyes the color of dust. Her hair had once been blonde, but now it was ashen and falling out in clumps. Even so... She was a beautiful child. Press! Maggie looked around in disbelief as everyone in her line hoisted their partner above their heads. What is this? Lindy was struggling under the weight of her skeletal partner, but she spoke to Maggie for the first time in weeks. It's body weight day. She nodded at the girl. You're lifting her today. Maggie made a face. She didn't want to handle this fragile child. She watched Maggie with her strange, pale eyes. A counselor was approaching with whip in hand. The girl grew nervous. Pick me up, she hissed. You're going to get us in trouble. Maggie awkwardly lifted the child over her head. She tottered from side to side under the unstable weight. Hold still. I'm trying. The girl's voice was high and hysterical. Maggie adjusted her grip. Her arms were already beginning to burn. The girl was heavier than she looked, or Maggie had grown much weaker. I think I'd rather be in the other line. They get the day off. Lindy's expression was strained. She was angry, but she didn't say anything else. There was no time for talk. The workout was beginning. They lunged for miles, holding their weights overhead. Maggie's arms burned and trembled uncontrollably. Her elbows threatened to buckle. She fought and struggled to keep the girl up. The workout went on for hours. They sprinted up hills carrying their partners. They jumped onto boxes with the bodies held overhead. Waves of excruciating pain were interspersed with moments of numbness that made her feel completely separated from her arms. The final march was the worst. After lying still for the entire day, the girl could no longer hold it in, and her bowels let loose. It ran down Maggie's arms in warm, vile rivulets. Maggie gagged and stumbled. She dropped the girl and fell to her knees. 
She vomited violently into the sand, and the line stopped. The air was filled with screeching whistles and shouts from the counselors. The first counselor to arrive was pale and covered with purplish acne and scars. One eye was sewn shut. It looked ugly and infected. The skin around the wound was a bruised shade of purple, and green pus oozed from around the uneven stitches. He grabbed Maggie by the throat and lifted her off the ground. He was screaming in her face, but she couldn't understand him. He spoke in mangled sounds, and when he opened his mouth, Maggie saw that his tongue was a crusty, ragged stump, recently cut and black with infection. Maggie couldn't think about it for very long. The crushing pain in her throat distracted her from any other thought. Darkness was trying to take over, but she fought it with what little strength she still possessed. Still, the darkness was winning. He cast her suddenly to the ground. She curled her body into a tight ball and gasped and choked. Her lungs were burning, and they tried to reject the new abundance of oxygen. Maggie struggled to take in tiny sips of air. The counselor placed his enormous foot on her back and pressed her into the ground. The road was packed black sand. The surface was hard and dry. Maggie could feel her ribs on the verge of cracking. She turned her face to the side and waited for the pain. She saw the girl. Her pale, skeletal body lay in a puddle of filth at the same place where Maggie had dropped her. Anyone else want to put their body down? Anyone else afraid of a little shit? A second counselor sneered down at Maggie. He was almost normal looking. Not attractive, but not a deformed monster like the others. He leaned down and spit in Maggie's face. He tapped the acne-scarred brute on the arm, and the crushing pain eased as he released her. Body? Maggie couldn't stand. She crawled to the girl, but she already knew what she would find. The girl was dead. Her body was rigid. Her arms stuck out awkwardly at her sides. They propped her body up in an unnatural position, and she lay suspended slightly above the ground. The line was moving again. No one looked at Maggie. Some of the campers were covered in urine and feces, but they didn't seem to notice. They shuffled past and kept their tired eyes on the ground. The tongueless counselor was watching her with his remaining eye. His hand tightened around the handle of his whip. She forced herself to her feet and bent to lift the girl's tiny frame. She gagged and wept and struggled under the dead weight. Finally, she managed to hoist the body overhead and rejoin the line. They marched past the cabins and out into the dry, burning sands of the desert. They marched for what felt like hours. The sun went down, and they shuffled on in the darkness. After a long time, the counselor's whistles sounded, and the lines stopped. Maggie couldn't see anything past the man in front of her. His bones were sharp and protruding. She could see them through his pale skin in the dim light from a cloud-covered moon. A whistle blew three times. The line shuffled slowly forward. Maggie could hear quiet crying. A woman somewhere in front of her was pleading with someone. Her voice was muffled, but Maggie heard her clearly. No, I won't do it. Not again. Please. Then the woman screamed. It went on for a while, but slowly faded. There was a soft thud, and she fell silent. The man in front of Maggie had reached the front of the line. The moon was out from behind its cloud, and she could see where the dark sand ended. The man carried his load to the edge of the vast black pit. Three counselors stood nearby. They watched silently with their arms crossed over their broad, muscular chests. Their misshapen faces were stony and emotionless. Do it. The counselor barked out the command and the man threw his dead counterpart over the cliff. Maggie tried to scream, but the sound caught in her throat. Maggie tried to scream, but the sound caught in her throat. The girl's body slipped, but didn't fall. Maggie couldn't move. She couldn't approach the gaping darkness. The counselors were growing impatient. Maggie could see their muscles tense. They would soon strike, and she feared what would happen next. Two tears slid down her cheeks, unexpected and betraying. Keep it together. Play along. She found herself echoing the words of the crying woman. No, please, no. A heavily tattooed counselor stepped forward and in one quick movement sent Maggie flying back into the dirt. 
One hand sent a rock tumbling into the blackness beyond. It hit with a soft thud a moment later. She was dangerously close to death. The girl's body lay face down a few feet away. It balanced precariously on the cliff's edge. The counselor smiled her broken smile at Maggie, and then she kicked the body over. Maggie heard it land, another soft thud. You're lucky I don't throw you in there with her. Why don't you? Shut up. The counselor's grotesque grin grew even wider. Her eyes were round and bulged wildly from their sockets. She balled her meaty hands into fists and held them in Maggie's face. Maggie waited for the blows to land, but they didn't come. The counselor put her lips to Maggie's ear. I've been waiting to get my hands on you, she whispered. I know who you are. She ran her tongue slowly up Maggie's dirty face and then shoved her away. The other clients were lined up and shuffling slowly away into the darkness. Maggie followed. There was nothing else she could do. Play along. For now. Lindy and Tanya were already at the cabin when Maggie returned. She eyed them suspiciously. Where's Maureen? Lindy rolled over in her bunk and didn't answer. Tanya was chewing on her nails. Her eyes were red and wet, and she stared at Maggie silently for a long time. Did you do it? Maggie didn't respond. Tanya nibbled another nail. She kept her focus on her bleeding cuticles. Did you throw the body over? No, I didn't. Tanya's face threatened to crack into a smile. Her thin lips turned up slightly at the corners. I knew it, she said quietly. She lifted her gaze to Maggie's face. You're the one. You're going to save us. I knew it. Maggie held up her hands in protest. Wait, no, I'm not who you think I am. I can't do anything. Not anymore. My powers are gone. How am I supposed to help anyone? Tanya's eyes were bright. She selected another nail and began to gnaw on it. You're going to save us. I just know it. Then she did smile. Just slightly, but it was there. She lay down in her bunk and pulled her blanket over her head. She was snoring a moment later. Maggie climbed slowly into her bunk. The pain in her arms was excruciating and she clung to the rung of the ladder as a wave of pain shuddered through her tired body. She saw Lindy shift and roll over. Their eyes met. Where is Maureen? Lindy didn't answer immediately. She may be gone forever, or she may return. She may be replaced. New girls will be brought to the bunk, like you were. Maggie folded her legs under her and stared at her dirty, blood-stained hands. I can't save anyone, Lindy. I don't know how. I know. You're the same as the rest of us. It's very... disappointing. I'm sorry. I never wanted to be a leader. Lindy sat up in her bed. She looked angry. I always knew you were a fraud. I heard about you in Famicili. Mr. Pratt was trying everything in his power to break you, but you were special. You were unbreakable. She looked sad. I found you. I had to see for myself. I followed you around the super gym, and I watched you. You did your workouts every day. You did exactly what they told you. Your food addiction was the only reason you didn't lose weight. Yeah, I know about that, too. I saw you under the bridge. I saw what you bought. Maggie felt sick. I'm just like everyone else. I'm not special. Are you sure about that? Lindy shrugged. Everyone knows what you are now. A traitor. A weakling. A spy. Why did they let you live, Maggie? Are you working for them? Are you kidding? They're starving me. I'm dying. You still look pretty healthy. Well-fed. Maybe you're the spy. I would never work for those bastards. Maggie sighed. She didn't want to fight. I'm not a spy. I don't think you are either. 
This place is messing with my head, and I can't think. I'm so hungry. Lindy nodded. Silent tears streamed down her face. No one is going to save us. We're going to die in this horrible place. They sat in silence as the enormity of this simple truth settled over them. Maggie didn't want to die in this reeking bunk. She didn't want to be in pain. Her stomach already ached. How painful would it be to just starve to death? Slow torture. Game over. She lay down and squeezed her eyes shut. The tears escaped anyway, and her breath caught in her throat. There was no hiding now. They knew she was crying and she didn't care. Any mystery that had surrounded her when she first arrived was gone. She had been exposed. They knew she was weak and that because of it, they were going to die. She had killed them all. The curtain was pushed aside and Maureen shuffled in. Her hair was a wild mess of tangles, blood, and dirt. Blood ran down her face, and her eyes were wide with terror and pain. Her lips had been sewn shut with big clumsy stitches, and they were crusted with blood. She was trying to tell them something. She held up her arms and waved them wildly. Blood flew all over the room. Her hands were gone. And that is the end of chapter 26, book lovers. We are so close to the end of Super Gym. Next week is the final episode. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep reading.